Speaking of danger, U.S. stock indices may be at highs not seen since 2007. But my next guest says he thinks a storm is a brewing for stocks and that it's time to raise cash. Larry McDonald has developed 17 risk indicators for the stock market and global economy, which have been correct at every inflection point in the market since Lehman Brothers failed. Since Lehman went bust, if you added to your stock holdings during moments of politically driven fear and sold on complacent days, you would have outperformed the market by a long shot. McDonald, a political risk and market expert, is currently chief U.S. equity, fixed income, and political policy strategist for New Edge. He's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, A Colossal Failure of Common Sense, the inside story of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Larry, welcome to The Wall Street Report. Very excited to have you on the program. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. So what are your risk indicators telling you about the stock market and the state of the world now? Well, it's interesting. Back in uh, the back in November, December, the systemic indicators out of the 17, some are some are systemic indicators and some are more sentiment. Uh, and sentiment's more how investors are feeling. Back in December, uh, the, the indicators were much lower uh, in terms of systemic risk, and that was very bullish for stocks. And I was out there on public record telling clients, you know, I'd buy dips uh, in the market in December and November, but the last two weeks, as we've seen, the situation in Italy is very serious. You have uh, the Berlusconi uh, really challenge. He's, he's rising in the polls. He was 16 points behind three weeks ago, a month ago. Now he's within four of Bersani. And um, Italian yields have gone from like 4.15 up to, up to 4, oh, close to 4.6. Same thing in Spain. You have uh, the Rajoy government is uh, in some trouble. And uh, the yields in Spain have gone up dramatically. Uh, so overall, the systemic indicators have been creeping up very uh, consistent, consistently over the last uh, 10 days. Of the 17 indicators that you look at, Larry, which one do you think is the most important? Well, that's the one thing, Jennifer, is um, I always say it's not one thing, it's everything. So I would never look at one. But uh, I would say the most concerning to me right now are the sentiment indicators, the amount of bullishness out there um, is, is really one of the highest levels in the last eight, eight, nine years. So the amount, everybody's bullish. Uh, typically, if you look back over market tops, uh, the spring of 2011, spring of 2012, there were a lot of high levels of bullishness. Um, secondly, the amount of stocks above the 50-day moving average, the amount of stocks above the 50-day moving average, that's a pretty scary number, too. It's like 90, 90 to 91 percent. So if you look back up since Lehman, once again, if you sold stocks at when when you have if you sold equities when that that percentage of stocks uh, are above the 50-day moving average, you outperform the market. And uh, the other thing is the the credit quality, the amount of people thirsting for yield. And one of the things I've seen over the years is when people start reaching for yield, and when you see questionable uh, issuance, lots of big issuance, like huge issue sizes in kind of subordinated tranches, kind of weaker part of the capital structure uh, investments where people are just reaching for that yield, that's usually a problem. Those, those are some of the things that I'm concerned about. So it sounds like, uh, given that we are at, at kind of a market top here, we're seeing uh, highs that we haven't seen since 2007. Uh, there's a lot of bullish sentiment, uh, a lot of stocks that are trading above their 50-day moving average. Um, I mean, when would you ex expect to sell off here? Uh, you know, are we talking in the next month or so? W what's the trigger? Well, here's what I've noticed. In 2010, 11, and 12, in each year, it started in Europe with a sovereign credit blowout. So what I mean by that is Spain, Italy, Greece, their bonds start selling off. That leaks over to a sell-off in corporate bonds in Europe uh, and, also, and also financial uh, companies and financial companies' credits are weakening in Europe. And that leaks over to U.S. financials and then typically U.S. equities. So this is a cycle that's happened every single time before the sell-offs in 2010, 11, and 12, before those three sell-offs, this cycle was occurring. Now, this has started to take place over the last two weeks. Now, the trigger is when it really starts to impact the U.S. financials, because that has been the real warning sign. What I noticed this week, if you look at the credit default swaps in the United States on the investment-grade bonds, some of the bigger movers were Morgan Stanley, um, 
Bank of America. So the, some of the some of the bonds that sold off the most were some of the big financials. So you're starting to see that next phase. So I think we're getting pretty darn close uh, to a near-term top here. And I think if you most of all, if you look at March 1st to March 27th, you have that sequester. I don't think the market's ready for that. I really believe the Republicans are going to. Uh, th I think that the Republicans are resigned to hit the sequester, which is a hundred billion dollar hit to the economy with spending cuts. And I really don't think the market's ready for that right now. Larry, as far as the accuracy of your indicators, you say that the closer you are to a quote layman moment, uh, the more systemic risk is in the markets, and, and that could take uh, ten years to normalize. So we're about what five years out from layman. Do we have another five years before markets normalize? And once markets normalize, do your risk indicators uh, still work at that point? Well, what will happen is the risk on runs will get longer over time. So if you look at last 2011, um, you had that pretty big sell-off in the summer, and then you had risk on from, well, actually it was more through the winter as well. So it started in July and ended in December. So you had like a six-month run of risk on after that awful 2011 sell-off. And then in 2012, once again, from May to June, May 1st to June 4th in 2012, the market lost 11% risk off. And then from June, July, August, September to now, we've been risk on. And that's, I think, we're running close to seven months now, six and a half months. So over time, the further you get away from the Lehman event, that type of devastation in the markets, over time, investors feel more and more comfortable. They take more and more risk. And uh, the runs could go even longer. A risk on run could go uh, longer. But I think right now, the indicators that I see are, are really saying lighten up on stocks. Uh, immediately and then look for look for that political fear that political fear moment that we had in 2010 2011 2012 a better stat Jennifer this is an amazing stat if you bought stocks a year ago today and held them you're up about nine and a half percent if you bought stocks a year ago in June and held them you're up close to 19 percent okay mm -hmm. so there's no question buying political fear pays Lighten, lighten, lighten up on complacency. Right. I mean, in underscoring all of this and your your strategy uh, for finding risk is that long-term buy and hold really hasn't worked. I wonder once uh, markets normalize again, maybe five years down the road or however long it takes uh, as far away we get from this uh, layman moment, you know, will the, the strategy work again, uh, buy and hold? Yeah, absolutely. Buy and hold. We're getting closer. I think we're about a year, year or two away from buy and hold. Uh, will be a wonderful strategy for the forthcoming, say, 10 years. Speaking of risky investments, a lot of pension funds are still struggling to make up investment losses from the financial crisis. But rather than scale back risks following those declines, many funds are getting aggressive. Pension funds are employing a strategy called risk parity within their portfolios. The tactic has been around for years, but it's regained popularity as pension funds try to increase bond returns in a low interest rate world. Essentially, pension funds are borrowing money to invest in bonds to boost returns, the very strategy that contributed to the global debt bubble and led in part to the financial crisis. Larry, with the risks of investing in bonds heightened more now than in the past few years, will pension funds and therefore people's retirement savings get soaked once interest rates rise and cause ripple effects throughout the financial markets? Yeah, I think you know you and I were talking about that the other day when we were talking about this, this meeting where uh, it's almost another indicator. The amount of pension, the amount of asset managers in the world that are using leverage to juice up returns. So the fact that that's creeping back into the market uh, worries me somewhat. Uh, the first stages of it are probably no big deal. But if it increases uh, uh, anywhere near, the, if, well, first of all, you're not going to get back to 2007 leverage, leverage zones. I think people, but if you get halfway back, that's, that's a really bad sign. But in terms of, in terms of um, its impact for the markets, you're right. I mean, uh, if you look at the amount of um, pensions and college endowments that are in fixed income, I think it's 60, 70 percent of assets are in fixed income, very small amounts, uh, record low amounts of equities. So uh, you do have a very, very dangerous situation with the amount of capital that's in, uh, in bond funds today. And the problem is if, if we do have a, a period where uh, the, the, the markets really take off and um, you know, risk on applies and then bond yields can really skyrocket.
that's when uh, pension funds and big, big uh, college endowments could take enormous losses because they're so overinvested in, uh, in fixed income. Yeah, I mean, when do you think this trade has the potential to blow up? I mean, I know some of it could be tied to the Fed acting, but the Fed's not going to act for some time, and it seems to have sort of killed the, the so-called bond vigilantes because it's such a large buyer of treasuries. Uh, I, I mean, what's your sense? I think that it all comes down to Europe. The, the crazy thing, Jennifer, and I talk about this in my next book, the crazy thing is as you fix Europe, as Europe normalizes, that actually creates a situation where bond yields in the U.S. could skyrocket because the, if you think of all those countries over there, Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, these credits used to be very strong. Now they're weak. So investors over there want to own treasuries. So there's been a bid, uh, an in international bid, for treasuries because of the weakening credit quality of other countries. Once we fix Europe, once it's all done, maybe by next year, the year after, that creates a situation where that natural buyer, that buyer that's been there for 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, that's when uh, treasury rates could really skyrocket. So I don't see that for uh, until 2014 or so. Larry, thanks so much for coming on the program. I, I so appreciate it, and I hope to speak with you again soon. And don't forget, it's uh, at ConvertBond on Twitter. That's right. Always, always trying to get in a plug, right? Uh, that's Larry McDonald, the uh, Chief U.S. Equity Fixed Income and Political Policy Strategist for New Edge.